thank you so much for these friends and fellow members of the body of Christ. Father, I do pray if there's anyone here has never made that most important decision in life to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that tonight would be the night. I ask that God the Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin and separation from you. And I pray that the reality of your love through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ would just have a great impact in their soul. And that they would be willing to simply humble themselves and with the faith of a little child receive the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift that he alone can give. Now we pray that as we open your word once again that you will prepare our hearts and souls to receive the truth. We ask you to challenge us. We pray that we will not neglect this so great salvation that we have. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you there were five impossibilities and I had about five people come up and ask me what the fifth one was. <laughs> Let me quickly uh, quickly go back through the, uh, the five of them. The first one is, it's impossible to escape, chapter 2 and verse 3. It's implied, the word impossible is not used there, but it really kind of gives, lays the foundation for the other four. Secondly, it's impossible to restore to repentance, chapter 6 and verse 3. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out in this session what that means. We won't get to chapter 6, but you'll see what he's referring to as we go through the third chapter. Third, it's impossible for God to lie. Chapter 6 and verse 18, when he promises blessing, blessing is available. When he promises judgment, judgment is sure. He cannot lie. Very important for us, by the way, in the times in which we live to keep that in mind. His promises to us are sure. We simply need to claim them and live in light of them. Fourth, it is impossible for animal sacrifice to take away sins. That comes up in chapter 10 and verse 4. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. What kind of a, an affront, what kind of an insult would it be to God to have some of his people who have trusted in Christ as their Savior turn back to the temple which he has invalidated and abrogated and go back to offering sacrifices of lambs and goats and bulls again. That's, I think, what the author has in mind when he talks about crucifying the Son of God afresh. It's an insult of the highest order. And then fifth and finally, the one you're all waiting for, and it says it all. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Nothing you and I can do, no sacrifice we can make, no gift we can give, no service that we may do is going to be acceptable apart from faith. Faith is the key. Faith, as we sing, is the victory. So with those out of the way, we have dealt with the need to listen up. By the way, when Jesus said, he that has an ear, how many people in here have ears? Why in the world would Jesus use a statement like that? He that has an ear, let him hear. Because not everyone is willing to listen. You know who has the ear to hear? The person who's hungry. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. How hungry are we? That's really the question. We will know that we're listening when we have the attitude of the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 when Jesus said it's not right to take the bread from the children's table and feed it to the little dogs. And you remember her response. She said, yes, Lord, but the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. When we have that kind of an attitude, when we are willing to scrape up every little crumb of the word of God, the promises of God, the principles that we read. And I was just looking at Ephesians, one of the most fantastic books in the entire Bible. And I was, I said, somebody's doing some really good teaching here. You got the 
whole book laid out. And that's awesome. Because, friends, I'll tell you this, and I know you know it. There are a lot of churches that the Word of God is not taught. The majority of churches, the Word of God is not taught. People get sermonettes from Christianettes. People get a verse and then uh, psychological talk. Not the Word of God. So thank God you're in this church. Thank God for your pastor and pray for him because I'll tell you, the enemy is trying to tear down those that are teaching the word like never ever before. The struggles that I know of pastors and missionaries that are going through right now is just unbelievable. And uh, the pressure is great. So always pray, pray, pray. So listen up. Now we need to wake up. Our second challenge. Listen up to the word, now wake up. And you'll notice if you go to chapter 3 and verse 7 that we meet an old friend. And it shouldn't surprise you because every single one of the five warning passages begins with this same word. Therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? Well, he starts out in the first few verses of chapter 3 talking about Moses. And how the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, he calls in verse 1, the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, and that's the theme that he's going to develop, was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was faithful. But that's where the similarity ends. For this one, Jesus Christ, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Every house is built by someone, but he that built all things is God. Do you catch there the declaration of the deity of Jesus Christ, God in human flesh? Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. It's interesting here that the word used for servant is therapon. It actually refers to a noble, honorable servant. Back in the Old Testament, they had a system whereby if a man... Uh, had, say, six years of servitude. You remember every seventh year the slaves went free, but if he was a slave for six years and at the end of that time he was to go free, but he didn't want to leave his master, you remember that they would put his ear against the doorpost and they would bore a hole through it and put a ring in it. And when you saw a slave wearing that ring, you knew that it was what they called a pierced ear slave. In other words, now he was a voluntary slave. A willing slave. This is the idea here with Moses. And that idea will come up again later on when we get to Jesus in Hebrews 10. Because there's going to be a very interesting statement that he'll make about what God has done with him. And so Christ was the son in verse 6 over his own house. Whose house we are. This might frighten you a bit. There's... Any of you ever read Hebrews and kind of get frightened? When I was in Bible school, this book scared me to death. I stayed away from it. It was too scary. Because I read things like this. Statements where it says, Whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm to the end. Well, the implication, if you just look at it on the surface, is if you don't hold fast to that so great salvation that you have, you're no longer part of his house, and therefore you assume that you've lost your salvation. Something that is declared to be impossible so many times in the Bible that it's amazing to me that we still want to try to come back to someone might lose their salvation. God cannot perform a work of regeneration in a soul create a new creature within that person, take them and not only give them resurrection life, but you remember what we're told in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, he has made alive and raised you up and seated you with Christ in the heavenly places. Sometimes people ask me, how can you be so sure you're going to heaven? My answer is I'm already there. I'm seated with Christ. Do you know what it would take for God to oust one of his own children, to reject one of his own children, he would have to reject his own son. That's why Paul uses his favorite phrase, he uses it more than any other phrase to describe us. In Christ. You and I have been grafted into the life of the Son of God. 
So what does the verse mean? Well, the whole point here is a household is a family. And a family has a function. And each member in the family has a place and a role and a purpose. And when you and I or any other believer stops functioning as a part of the family, we may still be in the house, but we're not functioning as part of the household. And that's the problem that the author is dealing with for these people. So therefore, verse 7, the therefore is based on the fact that we may not be functioning as a working member of the household. We may not be functioning as a part of the body. You know, if you have an arm or a, a leg that's paralyzed, it's still in the body, but it's no longer functioning. It's not fulfilling its purpose. Unfortunately, too many members of the body of Christ are not playing the part that God intended for them. So therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and here is one of the most important words that you'll get out of this entire study today. Today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is uncertain. You can't change the past can't affect tomorrow until tomorrow's today. I tell the story when I was a little kid, I had a little horse named Beauty. Beauty was a little black and white pinto Shetland, and she was my pet and my pony, and I would go out and I'd put the bridle on her. My dad never let me ride in a saddle because he said, you gotta learn to ride like an Indian. By the time I was about 15, I finally got a saddle. So then I could become a cowboy, right? My mom told me, tomorrow never comes. I'm a four-year-old kid. And I said, what do you mean tomorrow doesn't come? It'll be here tomorrow. No, she said, tomorrow, it'll be today. Well, I didn't get it. So my dad and some other men were putting up hay out in <coughs> the pasture about two miles away. So I walked down to the barn, grabbed my little bridle. Beauty comes up to me, pet that she was. I put the bridle on her, open the gate, lead her out the gate, climb on Beauty, trotting along two miles back in the back pasture. There my dad and, and the men are putting up hay, the, the big, what used to look like a big loaf of bread, big loose stack of hay, using a go devil, if any of you remember those. I come riding up, my dad's up on top of the stack, and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, I have a question. He said, what is it? And I said, mom told me tomorrow never comes. And he said, it doesn't. And I said, but today is tomorrow that came. No, today's today. I'm sure that's edifying for all of you, but the point is this. <laughs> you don't have tomorrow. You have today. And today is the only time that you and I are able to make a difference. So the author says, today, as the Holy Spirit says, if you will hear his voice, our first class was listen up. This class is wake up. What do we need to wake up to? We need to wake up to the fact that we only have today. This is the only time we've got. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me. They saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation who said they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. Now we're getting to one of the key ideas of the book of Hebrews, and that is the faith rest life. Resting in faith. I spent quite a bit of time in the first hour talking about all the things that are going wrong. And it might surprise you for me to say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They can go from bad to worse. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change my mission. It doesn't change your mission. And it doesn't change the fact that if we are willing to take advantage of that so great salvation, if we're willing to listen to what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, what a relief it was the day I trusted Christ and knew that I had eternal life. You know what I had? I had rest. Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. What a marvelous sense of rest in my soul 
when I had peace with God. But you know what? The next day the battle began. And the next day the issue was not do I have salvation? I have salvation. I have eternal life. That's great. That's wonderful. But you know what? Life still goes on. Life's still full of problems. I still have lots of decisions to make. I still screw up and do the wrong thing. I suffer the consequences of bad decisions that I make. I hurt other people. And on and on and on and on. This is what I need now. And how can I find it? Same way I found the first one. Faith. Faith. Rest. Rest. The faith rest life. If the past year, past two, past three years, whatever, have created agitation in your soul, and I'm sure they have, they have in mind, we still wrestle with the same old problem. We still get caught up with the events that are going on around the world. But the one thing that we need to do when we find that we're lacking that rest is back up here. And I like Clinton said to me, if you do the first two, the others are kind of automatically follow. It was Washington. But this is where they'll lead. Rest in this passage is a picture of the land of Canaan. It's not a picture of heaven. We're not looking at the idea of escape and getting to heaven where all the problems are gone. I know a lot of us, I certainly pray for the coming of the Lord. And because the stage is set, I believe his coming is near, and I believe our time is running out. And I have a tremendous sense of urgency within my own soul that I must make the time that remains count. I've wasted too much time. I've made too many bad decisions. I've been selfish too many times. I must make the time that remains count. Because time's running out. And Christ is coming back. And what we do by faith, what we do in the power of his spirit, what we do for him is going to last forever. And that picture of the elders throwing their crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus, I believe, should be a challenge to each and every one of us. What will I have to offer him? What will I have to give him that says, thank you for what you've done for me? You know what? I can only choose to do that today. Today, if you hear his voice, today, if you're listening, don't harden your heart. Don't say, I'll worry about discipleship later, no, it'll never come. I'll worry about the plan of God for my life later. I'll worry about getting into God's word later. I'll worry about making things right in my marriage later. No, you only have today. You know when you ought to fix the problems in your marriage today. And I know one thing. I know that the pressures that we're going through in our country are creating tremendous burdens and frictions within marriages, between husbands and wives, between parents and children. But you know what? We only have one day that we can fix it today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Now, he's used the Exodus generation. And that's important because... It's going to explain a lot that comes up later on. If you would, turn with me to the book of Numbers. And I'm sure you'll remember the story of how the children of Israel came to the border of the Promised Land. Numbers 14. The story is told in Numbers 13 and 14. You remember that they got to Kadesh Barnea and Moses sent spies into the land. And he sent a spy from every tribe, and so 12 spies went into the land. They spied out the land, and guess what they found out? They found out that everything God told them was true. See, it's impossible for God to lie. He said it's a land of milk and honey. They came back carrying on a staff clusters of grapes that were so big that it took two men to carry them. The land was a land of milk and honey. The land was a land where God said you will go in and you will take cities that you did not build and you will have to find houses that you didn't have to build. There will be fields that are planted that you didn't have to plow and, and plant. All of these things are there for the taking. But there was one problem. There were giants in the land. So when they came back out of the land and they reported to Moses and the people, the report that they gave was, Everything God told us is true, but, you know, little words are important, but, 
there are giants in the land. And you know what? There are giants in your land. And I don't know what giant you may be facing now. I know a lot of people that are facing a lot of giants of all different kinds. And if there's not a giant in your life right now, thank God for it. I was just speaking with a lady about a relative unsaved. You know, whenever I hear that, I pray. I've already prayed for that lady. I sent my prayer to heaven that God would convict her and open her eyes, bring her to her knees in humility to trust the Lord Jesus Christ because I believe prayer makes a difference. You know what I believe about prayer? Every single prayer we pray, God hears. Everyone. You know what else? Every single prayer we pray, he answers. People say, God doesn't answer my prayers. Yes, he does. He just didn't answer it the way you wanted him to. He'll always answer it. Too often we pray for the wrong things. And sometimes when we say God isn't hearing and answering my prayers, the problem is he keeps saying no because all we do is ask for the wrong things. You know, one of the things we do, like kids at Christmas, right in the Santa Claus, gimme, 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 gimme. I'll tell you something very interesting. The more spent time you spend praying for the needs of other people and forget your own, God will start taking care of them. You'd be surprised. So the report of Ten of the Spies, it's a great place, wonderful land, but there's giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers in our own sight. We can't possibly take it. Joshua and Caleb said, no, God promised us this land. It was called, after all, the promised land. Is it possible for God's promises to lie? Of course not. His intent was that they go in. But here's what I want you to get. The promised land was a place of rest when? Only after the victory. Only after the victory. If we're not willing to fight the battle, if we're not willing to win the victory, if we're not willing to trust God to give us the victory, we're not going to find the rest. You remember what Jesus said? I'll give you rest if you're heavy laden. That's the gift of salvation. But there's a rest that you're going to have to find, and you're going to have to find it by taking my yoke on you, and you're going to have to go to work. And when you go to work in harmony with me, you will find, this is the discovery of the life of discipleship, you will find rest for your soul. The point, you have to win the victory first. The victory must be won. And so Joshua and Caleb said, no, let's go in, let's take the land. Peer pressure. Talk about the last two years. Peer pressure. Anybody felt any peer pressure over the past couple of years? <clears throat> to get in line, to conform, to agree, to all do the same thing. We all look like lemmings walking along over the cliff. No. Not going to happen. If we're not going against the crowd, something's wrong. We're the ones that are going in the wrong direction. Don't let fear drive you. Don't let peer pressure drive you. And for heaven's sakes, don't believe the experts. Because <laughs> they will lie to you. Our politicians have lied to us. Our military has lied to us. Our media lies to us. Our physicians have lied to us. There comes a point where you say, uh-uh, I'm not listening anymore. I don't believe you. And we are probably at the greatest crisis of people in this country having trust in any institution that we've ever been in history. And it's well deserved because, as I say, they've all lied to us. Don't let fear, don't let peer pressure drive you. Well, at any point, here's what happened. Come with me to Numbers 14, 26. When the people said they're not going into the land, the giants are too big, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long will I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. 
Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. God essentially said, you're not going into the land. You are in there spying for 40 days. I'm going to give you a year for every day. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and every single one of you above 20 years old is going to die. Do you think that could be changed? It's impossible for God to lie. Do you think they could repent? Well, let's read on and find out what happened. Moses told the people what God had to say in verse 39. Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Now they're all having a big cry fest. Oh, woe is us. They rose up early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain saying, Here we are. We will go up to the place that the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Moses said, why do you transgress the command of the Lord? This will not succeed. Do you get a little inkling here that it was impossible for them to repent? We'll come to that in Hebrews chapter 6. The whole point is not that God is not forgiving. The whole point is that not that we repent and we recover over and over and over. The point is simply this. Today cannot be claimed tomorrow. They had one chance, one day, to go into the promised land. And they chose to doubt the promise of God. And they chose to give in to fear, which is the chief tool of Satan. And when God told them that there are consequences, I must at some point show you the five stair steps of life because it begins with attitude and it leads to priorities. Priorities are what we make our decisions on. Decisions lead to actions. Actions always have consequences. And most of us, when we get to the consequence stage of life, we're saying, how could God let this happen to me? Not realizing that it all began with thoughts in our own head. It all begins right here. <coughs> There are consequences at times that cannot be escaped or avoided. And so the people said, we're going to repent. We're going to come up. We'll, we'll go in and take the land. Verse 42, Moses said, do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies for the Lord is not among you. The Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. You shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord or Moses departed from the camp. And the Amalekites and the Canaanites that dwelled in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Ormah. My point and the point of the author is a very simple one. There are things in life you get one shot at. There are times when a decision you make is going to have consequences that you can't change. And you may have that one day, that one moment, that one opportunity to make a decision that is going to have tremendous effects in your life or in the life of other people. And when that day passes, you may not have the opportunity to change it. Do you begin to get the idea that God takes life serious? Your life, my friend, is serious business. Your life matters. Your life is designed by God for a great and an eternal purpose. There are things that God has given you to do that no one else can accomplish. You are here right now. You are the person you are with all of the backlog of good and bad decisions that you've made, with all of the learning that you've gained, not only from life, but from the Word of God. You are here right now in a crisis stage of human history. And I'm going to say that our decisions from this point forward are going to have weight like we've never seen before. And we need to be alert and we need to be awake and we need to be listening because tomorrow won't be tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be today. And there's something God has for us to accomplish on that day. Go back with me to Hebrews. You'll understand much more. The author is going to actually give us two examples to explain some of the impossibilities
one at the beginning of the book. Exodus generation. One at the ending of the book. This is chapter 3. And both of them wanted to repent. And it was too late. This is what we call bookends. You'll actually find uh, as you study scripture that Paul is really good and the other authors of scripture as well. John does it in 1 John. Uh, Peter does it. They bookend what they want us to get out of the book. And the bookend here is you've got two examples, one at the beginning, one at the end, of two people or a nation and an individual who made a decision on a day that decision was at that point irrevocable. Be careful the decisions that you make. Be careful the way that you go. We used to sing when I was a little kid. I don't know if they still sing it, Dan. Do the kids still sing? Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. There's a father up above who's looking down in love. You know what he does in love? When we do the things, see the things, say the things, hear the things that we shouldn't do, what's a loving father do? Time for the bell. My dad used a lariat rope. I promise you, it burns like no bell ever burned. That was his favorite instrument of discipline. You could hear it just whistling through the air. And then that snap. And then the burn. A loving father disciplines his children. We're going to see some of that as we move into the 12th chapter. Verse 12 now has the application. I'm going to run through this really, really quick. Beware, brethren, a message to you and I as children of God. Lest there be in any of you, in any of us, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This is not talking to unsaved people. This is talking to children of God members of the royal family. But exhort one another. Later on, I'm going to tell you not only to listen up and to wake up, but to speak up. And here's part of what we need to be speaking. Exhort one another daily. I need you telling me, don't fritter away today. You need me to tell you. That's why I'm here tonight. Exhort one another. How often? Exhort one another daily while it's called what? Today most important day of your life today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know we think every once in a while we'll just take a little carnal vacation. You never know when you step out of line if you'll ever step back in line. Life is serious business. For we have become partakers of Christ. This word partaker Go back up there to verse 6. Remember when we talked about the household? The household refers to functioning members. It's not just talking about a family member. It's talking about a household. We have become partakers. The word partaker refers to one who is actively involved. We have become partakers of Christ. We are engaged with him. We are fighting the war with him. We're fulfilling the plan of God with him. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, it takes confidence. It takes courage. Where does confidence come from? Confidence comes from believing in the promises and the word of God. We have to hold it fast if we're going to continue to operate as a functioning member of the household. The minute we lose faith in the plan, the purpose, the word of God, we are no longer functioning in the household. We're no longer participating in the plan of God for our life. While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not hurt. Do you think God's trying to make a point? When God repeats something over and over, he's not even done. He's going to get in chapter 4, and he's going to do it again. Chapter 4, verse 7, today. <clears throat> today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Verse 16, for who having heard rebel, we know it was, Exodus generation. Was it not all of those that came out of Egypt? Do you know what the problem was? They were redeemed. 
They were redeemed out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. But they were like a lot of believers today. They were redeemed, but they were not faithful. They were not functioning as they were intended to function in the plan of God. Verse 17, with whom was he angry 40 years? We know it was the Exodus generation. He's trying to drive this thought into our mind. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Sometimes believers make decisions, and those decisions lead to death. We will see the discipline of God when we get to chapter 12. And we will find out that there is a series of actions that God goes through as his discipline increases, as his discipline intensifies. And folks, I see people all the time coming to me and they have so many problems. I don't even know how you could even work your way out of all their problems. But the one thing I know and, and I have to try to convince them of is this. You have made bad decision after bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. You have hardened your heart again and again and again. And every one of those decisions has a consequence. And the consequences build the longer you're out of fellowship with God. And now the whole weight of all of your bad decisions is coming down on your head. And you want me to quote a verse and make it go away? It doesn't work that way. And the hardest thing is to get a believer who has that backlog of evil decisions that is a mountain of consequences coming down on them to realize now the only hope for you is you're going to have to work through each one of these and you're going to have to face those consequences one by one and deal with them in a biblical and a spiritual way and dig yourself essentially out of the hole that you have put yourself in. And folks, you know what? I've been there. I've been there. And it's one of the toughest things that you will ever have to do. David is a good example. Years and years he had to deal with the consequences of evil decisions that he made. A man after God's heart. A man that all of us would desire to imitate. But a man that made a lot of bad decisions in a series over a period of time. And it all came crashing down on his head. How can we use today? How can I wake up? You know what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 14? Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Who's he talking to? He's talking to that believer who has been distracted, who's been led astray, who's been off on their own, who's been outside the will and the plan of God for a long time, and he says you're sleepwalking through life. It's time to wake up. Wake up, sleeper. Arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. And the moment we humble ourselves and get down on our knees and get serious about going before the throne of grace and honestly evaluating ourselves and being honest with ourselves and with God, that's when things begin to turn around. But a lot of times we go day after day, week, month, year without doing it because we're too proud. By the way, pride is the sin of the devil. It is the root of every sin that you and I will ever commit. How can we use today? Four things. You ready for this? We're going to jump into chapter four. Four things. You'll see this phrase a lot in Hebrews. Let us. It's called an exhortation. It's an exhortation that the author gives for the reader and the recipient to join him. As I said, I believe Paul wrote the book. But, you know, whoever wrote it, if you don't believe that, it doesn't really matter. The author is saying, I need this as much as you do. I need this as much as you do. I, I need to remind myself of what I'm reminding you of. So here it is. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let us fear. Four things that you need to do today. Say, wait a minute, you were just telling us a few moments ago that we're not to live in fear, we're to live in faith. You know what? There is a fear that is compatible with faith. And what is it? Let us fear lest a promise remains of entering his rest. 
any of you seem to come short of it. If you're missing the rest and the peace of God in your soul, you should be afraid. You should fear. Because something's not right in your life. And whatever it is that is not right in your life, whatever it is that is robbing you from the joy and the peace and the inner rest that comes from totally and completely trusting God, and it's so hard for us to do that because we think about the, re I mean, the, I almost said resident in the White House. We think about Congress. We think about this. We think about that. What's Putin doing? You know what? There is nothing I can do to change any of that. So what can I do today? I ought to be afraid of failing to enter into the rest of God. Victory begins with rest. Victory results in rest. It's always trusting in the power and the promises of God. Let us fear. That's the first thing that we need to do. Second thing we need to do, verse 11, let us be diligent. Diligence, the verb is spudazo. It's a word that means to have strong inner motivation. Strong inner, in other words, the drive that says there's a goal out there, kind of like Paul talks about in Philippians. Not as though I had already attained, neither am I already perfect, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and looking forward to what's ahead. Here's Paul, the great apostle, the great missionary, toward the end of his life, he's sitting in a prison cell. And he says, forgetting the things that are behind and looking forward to what is ahead, I am pressing on, pressing on, pressing on. There is higher, greater accomplishments for me to make as long as I am breathing because as long as I'm breathing, it's today. something that God has beyond anything that I have known or seen to this point. Let us be diligent. Diligence is the word that's used in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. It really means be diligent. Be diligent. In 2 Peter chapter 1, when Peter tells us the stages of spiritual growth, you remember where he says that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness? And then he says that Bringing in all diligence, this word, add to your faith, virtue, and knowledge, and perseverance, and love, and brotherly love, and so on. There's one thing that you and I have to add to make the plan of God work in our life, diligence. Let us be diligent to enter that rest. Let us be diligent to trust the promises of God, stick our neck out on those promises, and be willing to win whatever the victory is in our life that he wants us to live. The next thing we need to do is we need to hold fast. Verse 14. Let us fear. Let us be diligent. Let us hold fast. I fear a failure. I have strong inner motivation to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Now I need to grab hold and I need to hang on. I need to be just like a pit bull with my teeth buried into something and just refuse to let go. You ever see pictures of how those pit bulls, they'll have them bite into a rope or something and they just pick them up off the ground and they're not going to let go. By the way, if one of them gets a hold of you, it's not good news. They have bite power far beyond many animals. Not as much as a hyena. They've got about a tenth the bite power of a hyena, but most of you are not going to run into hyenas. My friends, if today I fear and it spurs me to diligence and I grab hold of the word of God with a firm and a mighty grasp, that's going to result in the fact that I'm going to be able to come boldly. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. You know where the answer and the solution to all your problems begins? It begins in the throne room of God. Every need you have, 
the supply comes from the throne room of God. Every bit of guidance that you need comes from the throne of God. Every comfort you need comes from the throne of God. The one thing the author of the book of Hebrews is going to teach us is the priority of our prayer life. You know, prayer life is easy to hide because we don't, I mean, if we pray to be heard by other people, it's not much of a prayer anyway, is it? Prayer life, the greatest part of our prayer life is private. It's between me and God. It's that time I spend alone with him in his throne room. It's what I express. It's how I respond. It's the impact that his word has on the communication that I have with him. He hears what no one else hears. He sees what no one else sees. We're, we're open and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do is what we see in the 13th verse. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace without fear. If I fear failure, I can come before the throne of grace fearless, boldly. When do we come boldly to the throne of grace? When we've done well, right? No. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find what? What are we looking for? Look at what he says. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. What's the difference between mercy and grace? There are two sides of a coin. Mercy withholds the judgment that we deserve. Grace supplies us with the good things that we don't deserve. Two sides of a coin. Mercy and grace. You know why the author puts mercy first? Because it probably means we failed somehow. We failed, we fell flat on our face, we come to the throne of grace, and we come in. I'm sorry, Lord, I messed up again, right? That doesn't honor Jesus Christ. You know what honors Jesus Christ? When you and I fail, fall flat on our face, walk into the throne room with our head held high and say, Christ paid the penalty for that, and I have total, absolute confidence in it, and therefore I stand before you unashamed. That honors God. That honors Christ. I'm not saying you're not humble, and I'm not saying that you don't regret bad decisions that you make, but you don't cringe before your Father. Because who's seated at his right hand? As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is Christ who died, yea, who also is risen again, who intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. Could I encourage you to come boldly to the throne of grace tonight? Could I encourage you in a nation that is under divine judgment, in a nation that could in a very, very short time cease to exist as we know it? Can you come before the throne of grace? boldly and pray that you will fulfill the plan of God for your life because ultimately my friend whether the nation stands or falls doesn't change your mission and my mission as a matter of fact the more it goes downhill probably the greater the opportunity we're going to have to stand with confidence and present the claims of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world to a soul that's on their way to the lake of fire bring conviction to that person that Christ is who he said he is that he's done what he said he has done and that eternal life is a reality because they see a believer not cringing and crawling, they see a believer who's not terrified and shaken they see a believer who's not running here and there they see somebody that's planted their feet and they say here I stand here's the word of God and I stand on the word of God and all his promises are true and he is faithful because my friends without faith it's impossible to please God. Let's listen up. Let's wake up. Tomorrow we're going to talk about growing up. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we're thankful for your love and your grace. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you for these dear people. Thank you for the folks that have traveled long distances to come and be with us. Help us, Father, to just bask in the wonder glory and the beauty of the fellowship of the saints 
and enjoy this weekend together as we feast on your word, the banquet that you have prepared for us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow. <clears throat>